I don't need to tell you that the abortion debate in America is unproductive. Part of the reason is that people often have very personal opinions on the issue, motivated by positive or negative personal experiences after having or not having a legal or illegal abortion, many people have religious convictions on the issue, and at its core the issue of whether a fetus is alive or should be valued as a human life is fundamentally a philosophical quandary which is exceedingly difficult to convince people to change their minds on. The way the debate typically goes in this country is that the pro-life side argues that abortion is murder, and the pro-choice side argues it should be a childbearer's choice to do what they want with their body. Now, full disclosure, I agree with the pro-choice side of the argument, but that reasoning isn't going to hold any weight with someone who believes that abortion is murder. A person with that belief is going to entirely discount any suggestion that such an, an action should be a choice. The abortion debate in America right now is not really a debate, because both sides, but I think actually especially the pro-choice side, does not generally listen to the actual arguments that the other side is making. They make arguments that are perfectly sensible to someone who already holds a certain moral or philosophical belief on the issue, but which are essentially useless at convincing someone who doesn't to change their mind. However, the abortion conversation does not always have to be structured around circular logic and unproductive debate, so long as we focus on what the debate is actually, or rather should, actually be about. So today, I'm going to take you through my personal rationale for why abortion should be legal at the federal level and why it has essentially nothing to do with self-agency of people with uteri over their body. So let's jump right in. Right off the bat, let's just acknowledge this fact. People will get abortions whether they are legal or not. Now, I know that isn't always the most sound argument for legalizing something, but I think it's still important to acknowledge. According to a 2009 report from the World Health Organization, legalizing abortion does not have a significant effect on whether or not individuals obtain them. It should be noted that this study was an analysis of different countries with and without restrictive abortion laws currently. We don't know whether this phenomenon would necessarily hold true for a single country if it changed its abortion laws, such as for the US. Data on illegal abortions was not collected before Roe v. Wade, and I don't really believe that whatever estimates do exist are sufficiently high quality to merit using them as the basis of analysis. It is also important to note that many arguments that I am about to go through which support the legalization of abortion rely on the assumption that there must be some increase in the incidence of abortions when they are legalized. Otherwise, the potential negative effects that arise from people not having access to abortions would never be reduced by legalizing abortion. But that's not to say that abortions never happen illegally when abortion is illegal, because they definitely do, in large numbers, even if the rates are not as high as what they would be if abortion were legal. And when abortions are legal, they are far safer than unsafe abortions. Unsafe abortions have childbearer mortality rates 20 times higher than giving birth, whereas safe abortions, on average, have mortality rates 25 times lower than childbirth, with rates ranging from twice as safe to about 175 times safer for abortions depending on when in a pregnancy one occurs. But even the pr approximately 1% of legal abortions that occur past 21 weeks of gestation remain safer than giving birth. Plus, mortality rates for abortion are comparable to or lower than those of many other common surgical procedures. One report by the National Academies found that legal abortions in the US have a mortality rate four times lower than that of colonoscopies, which is a procedure recommended for all adults over 45, while giving birth has a mortality rate three times higher than colonoscopies. So when abortions are legal, even without any change in the incidence of abortions, fewer birth-giving parents die. But I do, again, have to acknowledge that that's not a very compelling argument for someone who believes that an abortion is murder, and therefore has a 100% mortality rate for the child. So let's move on to looking at the effects of abortion on society as a whole. And if you think that societal effects of abortion legalization shouldn't have any impact on whether or not abortion is legalized, spoiler alert, I agree, and I'll get to that later. But let's look at this stuff anyway, because some of the information here can still lend valuable insight into the topic. So we're going to look at five affected aspects of society. Pregnancy out of wedlock, STI transmission, teen pregnancy, crime rates, and the economy in general. First off, the pregnancy rate out of wedlock. It has been increasing drastically for the better part of the past century, ever since data has started being collected. So is abortion to blame for the increase? Well, it's hard to say, especially for a person who has no formal training in data analysis. One thing that makes it hard is that before Roe v. Wade, abortion had varying degrees of legality in 20 states. Now, there are a lot of ways to look at the data, and some seem to show the period immediately following Roe v. Wade as correlated to some amount of increase in the incidence of people getting pregnant out of marriage. However, some other ways of looking at the data suggest that Roe v. Wade did not seem to have any significant effect at all on whether people were getting pregnant in or out of marriage, 
and perhaps that period actually had a lower increase than many other decades. The seemingly common sense argument that is often proposed, that abortion being a legal and viable option of birth control makes people more likely to be risky with having sex because they can just have an abortion if things don't go to plan, just doesn't always hold up when you look at the data. But the data here doesn't actually really matter for that point, because you have to remember what this is actually measuring. These are births, not pregnancies. If these people were actually relying on abortion to terminate unwanted pregnancies, most probably would have had an abortion and therefore would not show up as data points on this graph. Clearly, after the legalization of abortion, most of these people were choosing to have children outside of marriage. And while increasing rates of birth outside of wedlock may have all kinds of causes and consequences across our society, which I'm not going to be discussing here, the prospect of ab abortion being accessible is not what is making those births happen. However, there is a better, much more direct metric of sexual recklessness, and that is the spread of STDs. I was able to find one study which does find a causal link between abortion legalization and increases in STD transmission rates, with abortion accounting for about a fourth of incidents of the infections looked at in the study. Okay, so point for the anti-abortion argument. It should be noted that the two diseases looked at were gonorrhea and syphilis, which both are both treatable and only a fraction of the STDs out there, but yeah, we should probably work to prevent any preventable STD transmission if we can. If, that is, it doesn't come at the cost of sacrificing other advances. So with abortion, we could say that the benefits outweigh the risks. And as I'm going to argue soon, I think they absolutely do. But first, let's take a look at abortion's effect on teen pregnancy. Teen birth rates have been falling pretty steadily since the late 1950s, and abortion has not seemed to have any effect on that trend. If anything, the teen birth rate fell immediately following Roe v. Wade. But that wouldn't be too surprising. If abortion is legal, common sense would say that more babies will be aborted instead of being born. So what we really want to look at is the teen pregnancy rate, in order to test the argument that abortion legalization results in people, and particularly teenagers, being less careful about having unprotected sex because they are leaning on abortion as a fallback method to ensure that if pregnancy does occur, it will never come to term. The problem is that the data in this department kind of doesn't exist. As mentioned before, the only good data available on abortion seemed to only exist after abortion was legalized. The data we do have shows that the teen pregnancy rate was increasing after Roe v. Wade, and it has been falling quite precipitously since 1990, and it is now the lowest it has been since data started being collected in 1973 following Roe v. Wade. But there's no way to know whether that initial upward trend seen after Roe was occurring from before the decision or not, because again, there is no good data on abortion rates prior to its legalization, which would be required in order to ascertain a total pregnancy rate during that time period. And even if there were a change in the teen pregnancy rate from before to after Roe, we still couldn't determine whether the legalization was actually because of an increase. Correlation does not equal causation after all. So we just don't know enough of the full picture in this department to really make a judgment on how abortion affects teen pregnancy rates. One interesting finding that I did discover though is that teens and young adults receiving emergency contraception pills before having sex does not make them more likely to choose to have unprotected sex. And if that's the case for a birth control option that is relatively easy, non-invasive, private, and already in one's possession, I'd argue that it's very unlikely that one would be more willing to have sex with the possibility that they could get an abortion sometime down the road than if abortion were illegal. But I also think it's important to acknowledge that abortion is not the only birth control method available to teens or people in general. If individuals, before having sex, acknowledge that their actions come with risks but they have a method of mitigating those risks, I'd argue that if they have a good understanding of what their other options are, they'll choose those long before relying on abortion. And if they do use other birth control methods properly, they are very likely to be effective, all but eliminating the need for abortions for those who did intend to avoid pregnancy from the very beginning. So because this is a deep and comprehensive dive into this issue, I'm just going to take a moment to take a look at what role sex education can play into mitigating many of the downsides that come with the potential possibility of people having less apprehension about having sex when abortion access is made more reliable. According to Planned Parenthood, sex education works. Okay, I think that's about all you need to know, so, uh, no. Obviously, we're not done yet. Uh, there are quite a few studies on this subject, and unfortunately, I don't have any money to re read any full articles that require payment. However, from what I was able to read, it seems that most of the scientific lit literature finds that comprehensive sex education programs can reduce or delay teen sexual activity, 
and increased use of a contraception. There was one exception I could find that found increased rates of teenage pregnancy among those who had sex education, but this study notably was not conducted in the US. However, recent studies in the United States, which are most relevant to this discussion, consistently point to comprehensive sex education as anywhere from having no impact on to being significantly effective at reducing teen pregnancy. So it's probably safe to say that it has at least a decent positive effect. Meanwhile, abstinence-only education is continually shown to have no effect or negative effects compared to no sex education at all. In short, from the information we have, sex education is a much better way to prevent pregnancy than making abortion illegal is, considering that abortion being illegal quite possibly has no effect on teen pregnancy, while sex education in some forms clearly has at least some positive effect. And sex education does not bring with it many of the negative economic and social effects that not legalizing abortion have on both the childbearer and the child. So with that said, let's take a look at a couple of those other effects that abortion has on society. First, crime rates. If you're pro-choice, you're probably going to be quick to cite Stephen Levitt and John Donahue's papers claiming that Roe v. Wade caused crime rates to plummet in states where abortion was previously illegal. The problem is that it takes about two seconds to find other studies and articles arguing that the Levitt-Donahue study was conducted with various methodological flaws, and that in reality, the legalization probably accounted from anywhere from no change to an increase in crime rates. Now, the main paper that argues this was notably never actually published, but I'm no data scientist, so I'm not really qualified to evaluate any of these claims in depth, so for now I'm just going to say that for all intents and purposes, we have no idea what effect abortion legalization has on crime rates, and we may never know. So with that unsatisfying conclusion, let's move on to the economic effects of abortion. Abortion legalization, perhaps unsurprisingly, has positive effects on the economic outcomes of people that would otherwise bear children. When people want abortions, they want them for a reason. People who want abortions and can't have them will have a child that they don't believe they have the ability to support, and thus the childbearer, and therefore the child, will tend to not have strong economic outcomes. This is particularly the case for people of color, and there is plenty of data to back up this common sense assessment. Now, of course, adoption is an option, but this can be emotionally painful and philosophically difficult to accept as a true alternative to abortion. I'll leave a couple of articles in the description which discuss that further. Now, a counter-argument exists that abortion access harms the economy by reducing the number of children born and thus taking away labor. But again, that labor is more likely to be unskilled and therefore less valuable to the economy than that of children born to parents who want their children. And of course, while children are additions to the production side of the economy, they are just as much burdens on the consumption side too, consuming resources and food, funds for education, and, given their likely lower economic outcomes, money devoted to government-funded social programs and charitable organizations. So they honestly might be more of a burden than a positive addition. That's strictly numbers speaking though, because it's important to remember that we are talking about real human beings here, once they are born, of course, and according to some, before they are born. Which brings me to a somewhat related, more philosophical argument, which is that an abortion could be taking away the next Einstein or Shakespeare. But it also could be taking away the next Stalin or Hitler, so this line of reasoning just doesn't really hold any weight with me personally, especially considering that, again, the economic situation they'd likely find themselves in could easily keep them from reaching whatever their true potential is anyways. So, now we're more than halfway into the video, and I'm now going to explain why I think that every single thing I've said up until now doesn't matter one bit and why abortions should unequivocally be legal and protected at the federal level. And fundamentally, it all comes down to philosophy. And if that instantly turns you away, well, I don't blame you, but I'd really love for you to stick with me. Abortion is arguably the most philosophical issue in mainstream American politics. It is fundamentally centered around the question of when life begins. There are many places to look for answers to that question. We can look to biology, such as when fertilization happens and the fetus's DNA is fully combined for the first time, when the fetus's heart begins to beat, at around 6 weeks into gestation or earlier, when it can survive outside the womb, at around 26 weeks, or when the baby is born. Or we can look to psychology, such as when the baby is conscious, begins to form memories, develops a sense of ambition, I don't know. These are all very abstract concepts, and it'll definitely be a while, if ever, before we can determine when these developments occur. Not to mention that some of those may not even occur until after birth. And I really don't think a single one of these markers is invalid, but I also don't think that any of them is inherently more valid than another. 
From this point, we pretty much just have to decide who gets to make the call, because someone has to. And I just don't see any logical reason why it should be up to anyone except for the person who is currently holding the child in their womb. Ideally, we would ask the child what they want, but obviously we can't really do that. So the next most sensible person to make the decision is the parent with the fetus. Not someone living on the other side of the country, or state, or even your next door neighbor. That just doesn't make sense. Unlike gun control or immigration, I don't see this as something that society should discuss the merits of and the majority should decide what's the best balance for everyone. Abortion, as I see it, is fundamentally an individual and philosophical question. When does life begin? Abortion, no matter how you look at it, involves a relationship between a childbearer and an unborn child. And since one of those parties, the unborn child, can't speak or form opinions, the question of when life begins, and therefore whether an abortion should be considered in a case where a childbearer no longer feels they have the ability to properly raise that child, should be resolved solely by the childbearer. This is also why it should not be an issue decided state by state. As I alluded to earlier, it makes no more sense for the entire country to choose one way or the other than it does for a state or a county or a city or even a single city block. It is a question that should be left up to individuals. And when the federal government mandates that abortions be legally accessible, that is what I consider to be the most free state, giving the one person who has the ability to make a choice, the childbearer, the ability to make that choice. You may argue that we should instead be assuming that the child does want to survive, since they can't speak for themselves and they almost certainly would want to live if they could speak up. But again, when you consider the economic and family situations I explained earlier that they are likely to end up in, I really am not sure I can agree that they'd really choose to live if given the choice at this moment before they've experienced life. Of course, at this point we're getting really philosophical because we're considering what a child might want, assuming they have the knowledge of having life experience, but also the knowledge that they don't yet have that life experience. Okay, I'm just editing this video and I just realized that what I said is like completely oxymoronic and makes absolutely no sense. Essentially, just all I'm saying is, like, we're, we're imagining what it would be like if a child, if, if a person could see the future and know what their life would be and what decision they would make knowing, knowing the likely poor situation they'd find themselves in later in life, but what they would choose before ever being born if they knew that that would be the case. That's all I'm saying. But again, I just don't think it's right for the government to mandate that they know what's best for a child. We certainly can and should have discussions on the subject of whether abortion constitutes murder. But when it comes to the actual policy that comes of the discussion, without anywhere near what could be called consensus, as is our current situation, as I see it, there is truly only one person that can reasonably be left with the decision of whether to abort a given child. And although it is not a perfect situation, the best option available is letting the childbearer choose. Now, there are a few other aspects of the issue that still need to be considered, such as whether individual doctors or other healthcare providers should be able to refuse to perform an abortion. On that question, I think that, yes, ideally the decision should be left up to each individual to decide whether they are comfortable doing the procedure. If someone views the procedure as murder, they shouldn't have to perform or learn how to perform the procedure. Doctors do not become doctors to murder people, and if that's how they view it, I think that's valid. The one problem that arises, though, is when an individual who desires an abortion is unable to find any healthcare professional in their area who is willing to arrange and perform the operation. We can't be creating a system of geographic inequality where people who live in more conservative and more sparsely populated areas don't have access to abortions simply because the people around them are morally opposed, even if they personally want one. So that's definitely a complicating factor to consider. Another question is that of whether abortions should be funded by taxpayers. And on that point, I think that if we're going for a true compromise, then no. If we're saying that abortion is an individual decision, then it should truly be left up to the individual. Now, many would argue that abortion access is a fundamental aspect of healthcare. And if that were definitively the case, then I would be arguing that it should be paid for by the government, as I personally do believe that healthcare is a right and not a privilege. But again, I think that assessment of the nature of abortion as healthcare or not is just too subjective to impose upon other people. If we had a single-payer healthcare system, maybe we could have an opt-in or opt-out tax for individuals to choose whether or not they want their money to go to abortion. But I think that's a really slippery slope. 
Just the act of implementing the ability for taxes to be optional is bound to be overused, with politicians calling for all sorts of taxes to be levied based on an individual choice. But that's not how taxes are supposed to work. It's much more sustainable for everyone to just come to a consensus, or as close to a consensus as possible, as to what taxes we should be paying. And I think that for a true compromise, abortions should be fully legal, but not taxpayer funded, in order to keep any moral issues solely within the realm of each individual. Of course, though, that raises a huge red flag about accessibility for lower income individuals, which would just increase wealth inequalities. A private nonprofit such as Planned Parenthood might be able to fill that role, but we'd need to study the issue thoroughly to determine whether private nonprofits are truly sufficient enough to make abortion access widespread to all those who want it, and not perpetuate any economic inequality. Only then would I personally be comfortable maintaining that abortions should never be funded by taxes. But that's pretty much it. That was a long video, but that is finally all I have to say. I really hope that regardless of your personal opinion on the issue, I have at the very least provided you with some kind of understanding of the other side's opinion, and perhaps why the abortion debate is usually not really a debate in America. At the risk of sounding too condescending, I really do encourage you to listen to the arguments of others when you debate in order to make relevant and productive arguments for your own side, rather than just regurgitating arguments that only hold any weight with someone who already agrees with your own philosophical or moral perspective. That kind of approach won't get us anywhere, and it certainly won't get anyone to agree with your own perspective. We are in desperate need of having more productive discussions in this country and the world, and I hope this video will get us just one small step closer to achieving that vision. With that said, I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider leaving a like on it, subscribe if you think I deserve it and you want to see similar content in the future, and please share this video if you think other people would appreciate it. Also, this video's script, complete with comprehensive source citations and or additional commentary backing up and elaborating on everything I've said is available in the description, so please check that out for a much deeper look at any of the content in this video. I spend a long time writing these annotated scripts in order for the videos to be of the highest factual quality and accuracy, so I sincerely appreciate you taking a look. And finally, as always, if you think I missed anything, or if you have any other comments, thoughts, or questions on anything I've said, whether you agree or disagree, leave them below or send me an email. I would really love to hear your perspective. But anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.